Eminences, Your Excellencies, my dear fathers, brothers, sisters, and my dear friends. My paper is long. I've summarized it and it may be shown on the screen, but the connections will be a, a bit difficult to follow, but I hope I'll make myself understood. The topic is not that easy. The Eucharist is mission and mission is dialogue. I hope the transitions will be clear enough. The World Mission has been very kind to publish the full text in the last issue of their journal. Those who like to follow the fuller text can find it some other moment. I am first of all great, grateful to Archbishop Palmer and his, his team of organizers for inviting me to give my thoughts on the topic that they have given to me. The Eucharist is mission and mission is dialogue. The Eucharist is a mission. The Eucharist is an invitation to communion. It makes the church. Jesus said, I wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. There is passion in his words. Everything at the Last Supper speaks of closeness, intense sharing, warmth, depth. That is what we want to experience during the Cebu Eucharistic Congress. Stay with us, Lord. We say with the disciples of Emmaus. A meal is a happy occasion for close sharing, but the occasion I am referring to is unique. Here Jesus desires to draw his disciples into an intense experience of intimacy, of communion. It brings into existence the communion of believers. In fact, it makes the church. The Eucharist makes the church. This communion is for a, a mission. We heard that a while ago as well. In fact, the Eucharist is mission. The final greeting at the Mass is precisely go forth and offer to others what you have received. Share with others what you have experienced. If you have not experienced anything, you do not have much to give. Share with others what you have experienced. Through the Eucharist, Jesus seeks to draw the whole of humanity to himself. It happens specially through the believers going forth, producing fruits, and transforming society. I would emphasize these words, transforming society. Drawing society together itself is a great mission today, as it is fragmented with ethnic and religious hatred, political anger, collective greed, God's plan for the human family is that they be one. The boundedness among Christian believers is not inward looking. It helps them to reach out to the entire society going beyond the difference of class, caste, ethnicity, nationality, and economic background leaving no room for personal egoism, selfish ambition, and collective hatred. The Eucharist equips us for the mission. Jesus does not merely say, go. He assures us, I will be with you. These are times when the faith of even ardent believers itself is shaken. 
we need extraordinary courage and profound spiritual conviction to go forth to the other side of the street, to the remotest slum, the village beyond this river, the other mountain, to peoples of other convictions, the, to people really at the periphery, which Paul did, which Francis Xavier did, like many Filipino missionaries are doing even today. The Eucharist is called Panis Viatorum, nourishment for travelers, for missionaries. It supplies energies. It does not merely give a mission, it supplies energies. It builds inner sturdiness. The Eucharist gives life. As we said, it supplies energies. Jesus came into the world to give life, life in its fullness. It is good to remember this truth when we are under, under stress today in diverse ways. There are more Christians in painful situations in our times than in any other period of history, we are told. From persecution on the one side and secularization on the other. Iraq, in Syria, persecution. In a market-driven society where profit-making is the sole motive, we are under pressure even in this society. We need fire in our hearts, like the disciples of a mouse, to hold on to our faith first of all and share it with others. All the more when we feel exhausted, opposed, rejected, and persecuted. We need to be strengthened. Rise and eat, the angel tells us as he told prophet Elijah, the Eucharist is nourishment. The self-giving of Jesus in the Eucharist drives us to a similar self-giving. Can self-giving reach the point of self-forgetfulness? Christ humbled himself. He washed the feet of his disciples. He emptied himself and went to the cross. The Eucharist overflows into life in the form of generosity, generosity without limit, kindness, forgiveness, sincerity, persevering work. It adds a quality to our decisions at home, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in places of business and entertainment, in hospitals where the elimination of an unborn child is being contemplated, in the street where human dignity is dragged to the dust, in the executive office, lawmaking assemblies where the fates of millions are being decided, the Eucharist is present in all these places, ought to be present. The Eucharist surprises us. It surprises the privileged with an invitation to go out to the aid of underprivileged and the most forgotten. And the highly educated, highly educated among us, for example, to reach out with simple help to the least educated to the illiterate, as it happened to Francis Xavier, the University of Paris, Mother Teresa, and other Asian missionaries even today. Mission is dialogue. Mission is dialogue with contemporary problems, not only conversation, but a, a dis determination to confront them. Here is a central Christian message. 
when you run short of generosity, come close to the poor. I'll repeat. When you run short of generosity, come close to the poor. They will teach you. They will stir generosity in your heart. This was the experience of Vincent, St. Vincent de Paul, Father Damien. You yourselves give them something to eat, Jesus said, when the disciples wanted to move off and said, send them away that they can look after themselves. The Eucharist becomes mission and dialogue when it brings healing to emotionally hurt individuals, broken families, fragmented societies, when it revives faith in unmotivated youth, when it brings industriousness and productivity to factories, creativity and enterprise to management, sincerity and consciousness to administration, when it inspires Christian legislators, civil servants, public leaders to make political decisions in behalf of the weaker communities and seek the common good at national and international levels. The Eucharist does not remain in the sacristy. It goes out to the front lines of action. Jesus entrusts humanity to the church today as he entrusted Mother Mary to John. Human sensitivity today seems to weaken due to pressure from the impersonal dimension, dimensions of the new economy. Poverty deepens. Poor, the poor becomes, become poorer. Anger mounts. Tensions increase in the world. I wish we were at the nerve centers of some of these, that we would be at the nerve centers of these emotions to understand them more closely. But all is not lost. We are not in a hopeless situation. There are lights on the horizon. There is growing rec recognition of human interdependence conviction that our needs are identical, that we need each other, that we can combine concern for ourselves with concern for others. There is visible convergence of thought, fusion of longings, a desire for togetherness, and a thirst for the transcendent, an openness to the eternal. Dialogue today is responding to the cry of the poor. It is the cry of Christ upon the cross. Our dialogue makes meaning when it is with the refugee, immigrant, unemployed youth, landless laborer, a young person on the street, alcoholics, drug addicts, divorcees, unwanted children. And when we launch a revolution of tenderness in their behalf and bring meaning into their lives, that's true dialogue. That's true mission. It is often, it is often during the silent moments before the Eucharist that we hear the cry of the poor we find energies to sustain a sturdy effort and combining courage with compassion as Archbishop Romero did. If we do not recognize, if we do not recognize the cry of Christ upon the cross in the cry of suffering humanity, and if it does not elicit committed action, then our Eucharistic devotion lacks depth. And so often it lacks depth. We must learn to see Christ in the distressing disguise of the poor, as Mother Teresa used to say. However, thinking about the poor, we need to have a holistic vision 
of the social processes. An emotion-driven response alone is inadequate to respond to the needs of the poor. Whilst emotion can provide energies, intelligence must give the direction amidst the complex social processes of today. Solutions prompted by ideologies, empty pietism, like studied seriousness. A one-sided approach can be self-defeating in the long term. Only a multidisciplinary approach, a holistic view of, uh, a holistic view will help to address the various dimensions of the causes of poverty by studying these problems more at depth. For example, if we ignore the economy, the economy will punish us, rich and the poor alike. Diverse disciplines must dialogue with each other as faith with reason, also physical, biological, social sciences must keep up a conversation. Philosophy and theology, experts in one science should not overstep the boundaries of their competence and hastily absolutize their conclusions. When we do that, we are heading for troubles. Secular and spiritual wisdom must draw closer. Intelligence and faith must find ways of relating. Justice and mercy must embrace. Pope Francis insists that God's justice is precisely his mercy. Misericordia Vultus number 20. Dialoguing with God's creation, showing respect and concern. Christian concern is all-embracing. All it embraces the whole of humanity. It embraces the whole cosmic reality. As bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ, the whole of creation is called to a higher destiny towards which we mortals also make a valid contribution. We are called to be stewards of creation, not masters, as sometimes we pretend to be. We nourish and care for the environment and protect it, protect it from pollution, over-exploitation, keeping in mind the needs also of the future generations. We respect the natural order of things, avoiding unplanned deforestation, irresponsible waste disposal, and careless use of chemicals. We dialogue with traditions. As evangelizers, we ought to identify the meeting points between the cherished, cherished dreams of individual communities and the hopes that the gospel holds out. The cherished dreams of individual communities and the hopes that the gospel holds out for us. We seek to lead ideals and values of communities to a happy encounter with the evangelical proposals. This is evangelization in its true sense. In this endeavor, called the evangelization of cultures, the evangelizer is not merely a giver. He or she remains an assiduous searcher all the time. He is a constant learner, respects the values in the culture even of the smallest ethnic group, because the, there is greatness hidden even in smaller ethnic individual communities. Dialoguing with the millennial civilizations of Asia. Dialogue is to discover the presence of Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit among diverse peoples. Radham Doris Missio. Paul was attentive to the cultures, beliefs, religious values of Lycaonians, Athenians, philosophers, poets, Jews, Greeks, Stoics. Gaudi Vetspes exhorts us 
to listen to peoples of all shades of opinion, all shades of opinion. Listen, learn, dialogue, converse. You may not agree, but we keep learning. When people who differ greatly from us know that we respect them and we respect some of their intuitions, at least some of their intuitions, we build a bridge. It may be used today, it may be used tomorrow, but they know a bridge is built because we know how to respect them. Inculturation is not an eagerness to make sensational and xenophobic statements, but an effort to make the evangelical proposal meaningful and relevant, promoting, promoting and strengthening a community's cultural rootedness expressed in forms of beauty, harmony, dignity, values, concepts, depth. In fact, the Asian sense of the sacred confers profundity even on simple popular devotions that are extremely dear to our communities. The popular devotions are not empty of content or depth. It precisely has depth. Dialoguing with religious traditions. Formal dialogue can exhaust itself in the monotonous comparison of concepts and doctrines. So often it happens. So many of our dialogue exercises are empty exercises, are rituals. The quality of dialogue rises to new heights when people begin to share their religious experiences or when we bring relevance and purposefulness to our dialogue inviting commitment to a common cause. We approach other religious traditions that have inspired millions of people for centuries with utmost respect. We are certain that the Holy Spirit has never been absent from human search for meaning. In a fast secularizing world, there is growing attention when human anxieties are searched to their depths. Whenever we are able to search any human problem to their depths, an effort is made in this direction, people listen. When we lecture to them, they may move away, but when we are searching in sincerity, co-searching with them to the depths of individual problems, they do listen. It is at this level that religions can find their meaning, meeting points. Dialogue for social transformation. We are called to be the light of the world and salt of the earth. In other words, act as leaven in society, bringing the spirit of the gospel into various professional fields in contexts of injustice, violence, corruption, disintegration of families, erosion of values. Dialogue must pave the way for bringing balance to public debates about the rights of human person, bring balance to, to public debates, dignity of the individual, rights of women and children and minorities, care for the aged and the ailing, respect for life, freedom of religion, just legislation and international harmony. God's glory is the human person fully alive, Saint Irenaeus says. When dialogue leads to the penetration of evangelical values into various dimensions of culture and levels of thought, it influences the criteria of judgment. It paves the way for the development of social structures in favor of healthy human relationships and good governance. How often this is absent in society because we fail. Such a dialogue seeks to combine economic production with fair distribution of wealth. It promotes healthy relationship between the economy and the environment, legitimate, legitimate profit and just wages, scientific advance and human ecology, urban growth and social ecology, expansion of the dig digital continent, 
and the search for the transcendent. Dialogue towards peace, healing of historic memories, reduction of anger, generating of goodwill. It's a very important topic, too briefly going to be handled. The Eucharist is eminently a sacrament of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says. Peace in the family, in society, between classes, religious groups, nations. So much required today in the world. It is our vocation to build bridges, heal wounds, remove ethnic and racial prejudices, and work for the prevention of war. Adoration services should be moments for sharing the agony of Jesus in Gethsemane. The Eucharistic procession should be an occasion for reflecting on the sufferings of Jesus on his, the way of the cross. An agony that humanity itself undergoes today in facing terrorism, injustice, and ongoing violence. There is so much of collective anger in the world today. There is so much of collective anger in the world today. Ethnic groups, nations, societies, religious groups, and uh, other uh, uh, classes, um, um, uh, the group of the poor, for example. There is so much of collective anger in the world today due to negative memories of historic injuries. Unless they are healed and prejudices are removed, violence is bound to break out again. And that's a great mission for us as missionaries, bring healings to memories, not only individual memories, collective memories. Can we become the lamps of God who take away the anger of the world? Before the Eucharist, I would like to ask this question. Can we become the lamps of God who take away the anger of the world? At least reduce that anger, lest more of our Christians suffer, more of our people suffer. And the one who inflicts the suffering itself, he himself is a brother of mine. I, I cannot just ignore him and marginalize him and wish that he be punished only. Christ suffered for him as well, and he shed tears for him as well, and he cried for him as well on the cross. Dialogue means making humble proposals to a secularized society. This is part of evangelization. Dialoguing with postmodern secularized society is not easy, but there are reasons to remain hopeful. It is open, it's searching, it's sensitive, it is attentive. There is an eagerness for meaning, depth, precisely because these are values that are marginalized in society today. They are searching for latens deitas, deus absconditus, the hidden God who is not present. God is dead. God is absent. Well, Deus absconditus is there and he is search, searching precisely for him. It will be in the Eucharist that they will find him. The Eucharist leads us to deep waters of spiritual wisdom. Truly moral, upright life is itself a spiritual worship. The Eucharist will educate us in the art of persuasion in the area of faith to restore a sense of values and hold on to hope. We have lost the art of persuasion and we have developed the skill for denunciation and accusation, allegation and humiliation of the enemy. Why, do not, why don't we revive the art of persuasion? Persuasion with regard to the, the faith with regard to values. Most of all, it will prompt us to whisper the gospel to the soul of Asia. It's a phrase that I've used in some of my earlier articles. Whisper the gospel to the soul of Asia and awaken the collective unconscious conscious of humanity. Awaken the collective unconscious of humanity. Dialogue in search of truth and beauty to enlightenment, 
a decisive encounter with God. The evangelizer's confidence comes from the conviction that they are answering to an expectation already existing in human hearts, Radem Toris Misio, that through their work is realized the fulfillment of people's longings, Ecclesia in Asia. The awesome beauty of the Eucharist does not make people overconfident and overassertive. It just disarms. It's not to be described so much in aesthetic terms, but experience in its transforming power. It gives rise to a bewitching inner harmony in the context of which even silence becomes eloquent. Can silence become eloquent? Yes, in the presence of the Eucharist. A mystic air is inherent in these unspeakable mysteries. Do not be afraid, little flock. Jesus is telling the little community of Christians in Asia, the little flock, do not be afraid, for your father is determined to give you the kingdom. And as believers emerge from worship after breaking the bread, they ask themselves, were not our hearts burning as Jesus talked to us and broke the scriptures to us? Are we not ready to go to the ends of the earth, bearing his message to draw all humanity to him? That's what we're going to say as the Eucharistic Congress ends. And when that happens, we know that Christ's little flock in Asia has taken on its mission and that the Eucharist is mission and that mission is dialogue. It is this dialogue that opens out the doors of the kingdom to reveal the face of Christ to the whole of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Most Reverend Thomas Malamparampil. And now to give his voice of hope, Let's all welcome Mr. Paul Ponce.